The armory at Springfield, Massachusetts, has been an important source of history for American marksmen. President George Washington established it in 1794. Gunsmiths here have created the basic weapons for our fighting forces. Still seen in the Armory's Museum, the original lathe for turning gun stocks devised by Thomas Blanchard. It ranks with the great inventions of American industry. The Billinghurst Requa, one of the first attempts to increase the firepower of the soldier. One charge fired all the barrels. The Gatling gun, an early forerunner of automatic weapons, product of the mid-19th century and the beginnings of American mass production methods. War invariably accelerates the development of arms and new ways to put them to use. The Civil War saw the beginnings of increased effectiveness for the infantrymen. These scenes recreate the Battle of Bull Run. A new century dawned and interest in marksmanship had been stimulated by the recent Spanish-American War. Congress in 1903 created the National Bureau for the Promotion of Rifle Practice. The legislation, which was signed by President Theodore Roosevelt, called for the formation of a national body which would promote marksmanship. National Guard armories were built in the major cities, and men once more began developing their skills and techniques with firearms and their training was not too soon. In Europe, German militarists were seeking to once again dominate that continent. By 1914, the highly trained troops of the Kaiser were on the march against the Allies. The world was plunged into war. By 1918, a million Americans were under arms on the battlefields of France. Firing their weapons with the same amazing accuracy as the frontiersmen of a previous century, American soldiers built a distinguished battle record. Their equipment, the Springfield 03 rifle. They held fast on the banks of the Marne against superior numbers. New, more potent versions of the machine gun came off the production lines to support our soldiers. Other new weapons included the mortar and heavy artillery. World War I, the end of an old way of life and the beginning of the atomic age. Except for the military and law enforcement forces, most citizens bear arms only in pursuit of sport. During years of peace, they're out in ever-increasing hordes at the crack of dawn, waiting for a shot at a migratory bird in flight. <laughs> The period between World Wars I and II was a time of tranquility for the civilian marksmen. But the army was busy. Maneuvers were constantly held to keep abreast of new technical developments and equipment, and to carry out the peacetime mission of the army, preparedness. In 1936, the American soldier was armed with a new rifle, a gun of tremendous power and accuracy, product of many years of research. An investment by our government in the time and talents of a man employed at the Springfield Armory Small Arms Center. The man was inventor John Garand, who here explains the evolution of the M1 rifle. I'm speaking to you from this United States Army located at Springfield, Massachusetts. You are going to see some of the work that we are doing here at the present time. However, allow me to tell you some of the development at this summary from early colonial times to date. We have here one of our, the first rifle made at the Springfield Armory. This is muzzle loader, is a flintlock ignition type, 
developed by the Springfield Armory and News since <coughs> 1795 until the 1840s. Then this uh, muzzle loader cap ignition primer was developed by the armory and used until 1873. And this centerfire front end action came into use for the same purpose. This is the 193 Springfield rifle that was made famous <coughs> in World War I and is still a good rifle today. In World War I, about 1916, 17, I got interested in making an automatic rifle. And this one here is a gas piston operated automatic rifle that was developed and manufactured at the Springfield Armory in World War II and to date. This happens to be the three millionth uh, rifle of this design. By the way, this is a forging from which the receiver of the M1 rifle is manufactured. This forging is produced in our own armory, from field armory shops, and on drop hammers, and uh, represents rather heavy weight several times that of the finished receiver used on the M1. This For the future, we should develop a lighter rifle with the available lighter ammunition that we have now, and alloys, steel, better knowledge, it should be a nice project for the younger generations to tackle and furnish our infantry with the best rifle in the world in years to come. More than 1,800 separate operations make an M1 rifle. And this drop forge is one of the first steps as raw steel and wood are transformed into an instrument of deadly accuracy. A far cry from the early days of gun manufacturing as practiced here at the Springfield Armory, when in one year, 1795, 40 employees turned out a total of 245 muskets. At its peak in modern times, daily production reached 4,600 rifles a day. But the use of machine tools has never affected the high standards of manufacture at Springfield, a tradition established right from the start when gunsmiths had to pay for the material that they spoiled apart, and they faced fine or imprisonment if their gun didn't shoot straight. Many special pieces of equipment and apparatus have been developed at the armory. A strange looking machine is this barrel straightener, which is for visually checking and straightening the new borings. The armory is the small arms center of the United States forces. Here are concentrated the Ordnance Corps facilities for experimental development of hand weapons, including rifles and automatic weapons, also for pilot line production. Besides being the nerve center for small arms research, it is the repository of the latest production techniques and newest developments in the art of military gun making. Constant inspections make certain that Springfield products measure up to specifications. The armory also checks civilian produced items for conformance to standards. The inspection division trains and supervises personnel assigned to civilian plants. Close tolerances are necessary for parts like this receiver. The ghost of Thomas Blanchard stalks the woodworking shop as a modern counterpart of his lathe changes blanks of American walnut into gun stocks. In addition to its normal production, the armory is required to have extra capacity to handle special emergency jobs. 
a weapon of limited application, might take many months to produce outside. The 93 separate parts which constitute the M1 are all turned out from raw material, each of them fabricated with precision and interchangeable in any other M1 rifle. High standards are rooted in the American tradition of rifle design, standards which have produced a variety of models, all of which have been able to match or outperform the rifle used by enemies of the United States. These standards are preserved in the manufacturing methods at Springfield methods and trained personnel held ready to be passed on to civilian plants in time of national emergency. Test firing is one of the last inspections. The many rigid checks along the way and accurate methods of manufacture make it rare that a piece is rejected in this stage. The tradition of Springfield Armory, pride in craftsmanship, together with willingness and a goal toward which to point, has resulted in superior results. The best small arms in the world, insurance against aggressors. Aggressors who bomb without provocation, raining death upon helpless civilians, destroying homes and civilizations. This was Adolf Hitler's contribution to the world in 1939. And while Congress considered action, Japan made her contribution. With the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor, America was in a war on all seas. Civilians became soldiers, millions of them, from all parts of the country transplanted to the distant jungles of the Pacific, stacked against an enemy who had been preparing for years and was determined to fight to the death. Slogging and blasting their way from island to island with every inch stiffly contested and every yard gained only through vicious fighting. New concepts quickly became routine as infantrymen developed the tactic of vertical envelopment. Taking a cue from the enemy, the German successful airborne invasion of the island of Crete, American forces quickly enlarged the scope of the flying infantrymen and created a tremendous airborne striking force. But even though the tactics might be extraordinary, the paratrooper was still a rifleman, and when he landed, he fought with the same weapons as the infantrymen who advanced on foot. American soldiers in Europe led the free world back across the continent. Equipped with John Garand's M1 rifle, their firepower was infinitely greater than anything produced in opposition. With the confidence of superior arms, they battered their way to victory in World War II. By 1945, it was back to the ways of peacetime. If you wanted to shoot, it was usually in some sort of competition. Targets made of clay. The Garand rifle had proved itself over and over in combat, and every man joining the armed forces received thorough training in its operation. Indoctrination usually begins with a description of the piece. It doesn't weigh much, less than 10 pounds. For most recruits, this is the first contact with a basic weapon of the American armed forces. They learn that the gun fires eight rounds semi-automatically. That is, you have to pull the trigger each time to fire a round.
the use of the sling is described, and the new men are shown how it aids in accurate firing. But performance is the only factor that's important in a rifle. And in this department, the M1 is superior to any basic weapon issued by any army. It produces greater firepower without decreasing accuracy. An expert rifleman gives a demonstration of the abilities of the gun which every American soldier is taught to fire. The rifle is first demonstrated being fired from a prone position. The marksman sights the target. A full clip is inserted in the receiver, and in an instant the gun is ready to be fired. The cartridges are automatically ejected, and reloading is a simple operation. Simply insert another clip of eight rounds and commence firing. Another clip of ammunition, and this time the target is highly explosive. It's a can of gasoline. As new arms are developed, troops must undergo constant training in their use. When a new weapon, such as the recoilless rifle, comes off the production lines, it's a big job to teach its operation to millions of men. In addition to teaching the operation and maintenance of a weapon, its use in combat must be taught too. There is no margin for error when the chips are down, when the bullets and projectiles that fly overhead are real. A situation soon to come in the summer of 1950. Thousands of miles away on the other side of the Pacific, trouble was being fermented. North Koreans plotted by the communists were massing strength for a war against the democratic government of Korea, a war which threatened the peace of all nations. The strength of the free world was brought to bear against the aggressors. The combination of increased firepower for the individual soldier plus accurate shooting paid dividends in the bloody battles of Korea. On the firing lines in the hills and mountains, American soldiers defended the cause of freedom and stopped the threat of communists overrunning the Far East. For the third time in 35 years, the American fighting man returned home, never yet bested in battle, still the best equipped and best trained soldier in the world. Once again, our army took up its peacetime mission, preparedness and unrelenting vigilance, training in the use of newly invented devices such as the sniper scope, which gives a man eyes to see in the dark. The sighting device uses infrared rays, and this is how an invader looks through the detecting device. Camp Perry, Ohio, is the site of the World Series of Marksmanship, the National Matches, sponsored jointly by the National Rifle Association and the National Board for the Promotion of Rifle Practice. Teams from military units are competing in the National Trophy Matches, while civilians compete for trophies in the NRA National Championships. Service personnel are from all over the world. They've qualified for entry by winning titles in their regions. But these matches are equally important to civilian shooters. This is the culmination of a full year of practice and competition in which they have received much cooperation and encouragement from the military.
The small arms firing school is in session during the matches. Here, members of National Guard units and members of friendly foreign armies and civilians receive instruction in the construction, operation and firing of the M1 rifle. These championship matches increase the knowledge and skill of the participants and are helpful to the army-wide marksmanship training program. Men who can shoot and hit the target are usually able to teach others to do the same thing, both in the service and in the thousands of rifle clubs across the country. Some of these men will represent our country in international competitions, such as the Olympic Games and other world championship rifle and pistol events. Trophies won by Army competitors at these national matches were presented in a ceremony at Washington, D.C. by Army Chief of Staff General Matthew B. Ridgway. Corporal Edward F. Grimes, Fort Evans, Massachusetts, presents the Daniel Boone Trophy. Corporal Grimes was the winner of the National Trophy Individual Rifle Match, defeating more than 750 competitors. This gave the Army victory in three of the four matches sponsored by the Army. These honors for the sharpshooter are the result of aptitude and training. Training which can be given at an early age in junior clubs such as this group, the Fairlington Junior Rifle Club of Arlington County, Virginia. In just a few years of existence, this organization has produced many young riflemen who have qualified as experts. The group was organized by 12 members under a charter from the National Rifle Association and was thereafter immediately affiliated and enrolled with the Director of Civilian Marksmanship, Department of Army. In doing so, they became eligible for Army assistance as prescribed by law. One of the principal advantages is access and use of this government-owned firing range at Fort Belvoir. All regular summer and winter practice sessions of the club are held here. Small arms ammunition and target supplies may be purchased at government cost through Army Ordnance Depots with approval by the Office of the Director of Civilian Marksmanship. Many of these children, because of their physical size, are unable to effectively handle the heavier government-owned weapons and thus are required to purchase their own so they may be modified. Through simple modifications, even the youngsters are able to meet the requirements of proper shooting techniques. This club's competitive shooting program is fully attended by its membership, and it is this type of supervised activity which deters youngsters from falling into ways of juvenile delinquency. While the entire group has much team spirit, each individual is constantly striving for his or her own qualification awards. There is complete confidence in the leadership provided by the qualified instructors. Each member is trained in all of the same principles of marksmanship as taught by the Army. Proof of the value of proper equipment and of a continuous training program may be found in the fact that a team from this club, all under 14 years of age, won a national title during their second year of operation. Assistance in the marksmanship training of the youth of America is an important function of the defense establishment. In our history, our soldiers have always had the ability and the equipment to hit the mark. Our future rests with youth to continue that tradition.